It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show. You know, our mission is to serve you with advice and information that empowers you so you make better financial decisions in your life. I was just talking to my sister-in-law who loves our free daily newsletter. I guess she has too, as my sister-in-law at least tell me she does, but she loves reading the Clark.com daily newsletter. And I was telling her about the Clark Deals daily newsletter. They're both free. If you just go to Clark.com slash newsletter, you can see or newsletters, either will work. Just go there and sign up. And I hope that I am able to make you money and save you money repeatedly with our free newsletters. And I want to tell you, I saw something today regarding your heart health. It's a non-invasive test you can do that can be very telling. And also in today's show, if you've been waiting until spring to list a home you're thinking of selling, I want to tell you what the market is looking like is the spring selling season, depending on where you are in the country, has kicked off or will soon in the next few weeks. There's not like an official kickoff date. It's just a tradition in different micro markets with real estate when they consider the spring selling season to be underway. So I had aortic valve replacement surgery uh, robotically, it's called a TAVR, in December. And it was really great. They cut me. They put in a new valve that's part cow, part metal, part fabric, made in California. And um, I went home uh, like 20 hours later. And the thing they told me is the most important thing for me to do to recover from a valve replacement is walk and walk and walk. And I've been doing it. What was funny is my first uh, thorough follow-up after the surgery, they did a bunch of tests on me to see how I was doing, uh, imaging, all that. But then they did something that I was like, huh? I've never had anything in this, like this in my life. They did a walking test with me. And there's somebody following with a stopwatch and somebody following with a clipboard. And I'm like, what is going on? And then I saw something on CNN Health that explained it. And it is what's known as a gait test, G-A-I-T. You know, how am I walking? How steady am I? How fast am I walking? And so now I've become obsessed when I walk, doing what the great, late, wonderful, incredible Satchel Paige, who was uh, an amazing baseball player, said, never look back. You never want to see who's gaining on you. No, I'm doing that all the time. <laughs> I'm violating the Satchel Paige rule. I'm always looking to see what's my speed compared to other people. Am I walking with authority? Am I walking with good balance? All that. And there was a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Directors Association. Never heard of that publication. But it was a meta-analysis of 44 studies, over 100,000 participants. And what they found out is that how your gait is going is a key indicator of a lot of health things and signs of mortality, particularly for cardiovascular disease or cancer. I mean, wow. So that's why, and it turns out, I'm going to have this gait test routinely as part of follow-ups on my heart surgery because it's been shown to be a direct cause and effect. If I'm walking uh, too leisurely, if I'm walking without authority, you know, without good balance, good stride, it's an indicator that maybe my valve or my heart aren't doing particularly well. And so 
when you are walking, if you're a regular walker like I am, then you do want to assess yourself. See how you're doing versus other people. If you have somebody who walks with you, have them uh, kind of give you a readout on how you're doing. And Krista, I have a failure report for you. Uh-oh. I have my February data. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been walking since my surgery. My goal has been 18,000 steps a day. Mm -hmm. In February, I only averaged 15,550. Slacker. <laughs> Failure. Failure. So uh, in the month of March, I'm now tracking more than 18. I'm going to stay more than 18. I'm going to do what works out to be uh, 9 to 10 miles a day okay. of walking. Don't push yourself too much either. There's balance in life, you know. Have you ever known me? <laughs> Well, you know, to show an balance in life. there's opportunity for growth. Yeah. For all of us, I, I, for sure. I think that, uh, that that is both a benefit to me and a deficit to me that I just, I'm like full steam ahead at all times. And you're a numbers guy, for sure. We all know that. <laughs> all the Clarkies know. All right, we're going to go to questions. Kate yeah. in Virginia says, Hi, Clark. We're solidly middle-class family with a child who is a sophomore in high school. When my grandmother passed away many years ago, she left us some money that we have put into a brokerage account to save for some big ticket items like a new roof and new HVAC system, both of which we will need within 10 years. I'm concerned that as my son approaches college, this money will be seen as money we should be putting towards college, and it may count against any financial aid offer. Should we spend this money now so get the new roof and HVAC before he becomes a senior? Is it that big of a deal to have twenty to thirty thousand dollars in a brokerage account when he approaches college? So, uh, Kate, if you added a zero to that, it would be if it was two hundred, three hundred thousand, it would be really a strong impact on financial aid at twenty to thirty thousand, specifically dedicated to home improvements, uh, home repair, new roof, HVAC, it doesn't have that much impact because any money that's in your child's name overwhelmingly is expected by a university or college to be used towards the college expenses. Money that's in your name, only a tiny percent of your asset base is expected to be used towards college. So it would be uh, not a major impact at all having that amount of money aside. And I love that you put this money aside prepping for when you're going to have to do a repair. Is to the impact, depending on the college, based on that money, they might expect 1000 1500 something like that to be used towards uh, college expense. Not, not a major amount that would have you prematurely replacing a roof or HVAC. You want to get the useful years of life out of each. Eric in Wisconsin says, my rheumatologist, who's part of a big mega hospital system here in Wisconsin, recently added a form during check-in where there's verbiage stating, I'm aware that some physicians may not participate in the health plan or payment program that pays for my care, and thus I may be subject to additional or out-of-network charges. How can they get away with making me sign this form in order to see them? So, Eric, this is terrible um, because they're, they're having cost-shifting issues where customers, patients are calling saying, wait, 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 why am I being billed this? I went to, you know, I went to your place. So they're giving you uh, basically an upfront legal notice that in the negotiations, individual rheumatologists may accept your insurance, but others in a very large practice don't. And that you're the one who's going to get stuck because this doesn't come under my understanding of the No Surprises Act because this is not um, emergency care or anything like that. So it means they're giving you notice that before you accept care from anyone in the practice, you're going to have to reassert each time that they are, in fact, 
active as part of your insurance, which is putting an additional responsibility on you, but doing that and knowing that up front is going to help you avoid almost always really ugly bill shock that would come out of network. Richard in Georgia says, I'm planning to reward my nine-year-old daughter for making all A's with a trip to see her uncle in Baltimore. I'm intrigued with the Kids Fly Free program with Frontier. I see that I would have to join Frontier's Fair Club to qualify, but it seems one trip would pay for the membership with the free flight. I'm sure there are hidden strings, though. Do you have any details on this program? I also have a 13-year-old son who I'm hoping to likewise reward for his good grades with a trip to New York this summer. So, Richard, um, joining the DEN, uh, the Frontier DEN, is what you have to pay the annual fee for. And then you can bring a minor child up to a certain age. The Kids Fly Free program has very specific rules. If you just uh, go on whatever search engine you, you, you use and you click on, you search Kids Fly Free Frontier, you see the full briefing and it goes through the whole thing, what the rules are, for the kids, you pay 60 bucks to join the den, gets you uh, potentially a lower fare yourself, and then the, the, your kids fly free, but click on, when you went under the kids section, click on the full terms and conditions of when a kid flies free. They can be up to 14 years old, um, under 15 qualifies, I just call that, 14 and younger qualify for the free ticket uh, minus whatever, or in addition, whatever junk fees there are. But read all the terms and conditions. And if you do go to Baltimore, take the train down to D.C. and show your straight-A student uh, the stuff in the nation's capital. Your nine-year-old will love seeing all the stuff there because it's it's really really fun seeing the monuments and seeing the White House and seeing the Capitol. And you can even contact your uh, member of Congress's office for a tour of the Capitol and potentially of the White House. Certain portions of the White House. The tours are harder to do now, but you may be able to do that because the ride from from downtown Baltimore to Union Station, D.C., it's about, uh, depending on the train, about 45, 50 minutes to ride on down. But yeah, uh, give it a try. It's great. And you can already be teaching your nine-year-old fundamental economics that no matter how long this trip is, that she's only flying with a little teensy tiny micro backpack with whatever she wants to take that goes, they can go under the seat in front of her so she doesn't have to pay any junk fees. And I love that. And then take your 13-year-old to New York because your 13-year-old obviously is eligible under age 14. Good grades. So congratulations to both of them. And coming up ahead, I want to talk about the complications of this year's spring home selling season. There's a tradition in much of America that the spring selling season is big time where people put their own home up for sale and market it. And last year, we basically didn't have a spring selling season. This year, there's pent up demand at the same time Home prices haven't really gone anywhere over the last year, but mortgage rates have also stayed stubbornly high. So it's rough for buyers. And you think about that seller. Why was there no spring selling season to speak of last year? And it'll be uh, pretty quiet, relatively speaking, to historical numbers this year, but busier than last year. Because the person who sells you the house they're going to go somewhere, and they go from whatever economic conditions they had in the house they're in to now having to be at the mercy of what the market's doing now with higher prices, higher interest rates. And yeah, they get 
uh, elevated amount for their home, but then they got to go to another home, an elevated price, but no bargain mortgage anymore. So what's happened in the market is a very unusual circumstance we haven't seen since the 1940s. A big portion of the housing market this year, as it ended up being last year, is going to be new home construction. New home construction is usually a very small part of housing sales uh, because only so many new homes are added each year. There's a very large uh, base, installed base of existing homes. People's lives change. They end up going different places, all those things. And right now, people are in housing lock. They're not leaving where they are. So the new home market is very strong. The stocks of new home builders go up and down based on interest rate movements and things like that. But generally, they're doing very well. And so the activity this spring will be activity with used homes, existing homes. But the real game is going to be new homes again. And what is the lure that new home builders are offering in the market that was something that first popped up on my radar a year and a half ago and now is very common, subsidizing the mortgage interest rate on that home. Instead of saying, oh, we'll upgrade your countertops or we'll build you a nice porch or we'll finish your... Uh, if, you, if there's a basement, finish the basement for you, all those things. Nope, those are not the incentives now. They're all geared towards financing. And the lender will sell through the builder an interest rate that's lower than market because the builder pays the lender for a buy-down. There are buy-downs that are just for a few years, and there are buy-downs that are even for 30 years. It's just depending on what is the most important for you to know you've got low cost for the life of a loan if you intend to stay in that house a really long time or just for a few years, you let interest rates settle down, you refi at a later point, or you don't intend to stay in that house for a long, long, long time. Um, I love for people who aren't sure how long they're going to stay, if a builder's offering a buy down for 30 years of the interest rate, that's a market opportunity. Um, there are people, though, who can sell a house that they live in and they're not worried about what's going on with the marketplace because they're planning to move into an area of the country where housing costs are lower or they're in a position because of what they've made embedded in the gain from their existing house they buy a cheaper one that they can buy for cash. And then the whole mortgage interest rate thing doesn't matter. Um, one thing you will see, and this is a trend all over America, builders are building more practical square footage. What's more practical square footage? They're building what you need in a house and not putting in it things that you don't need, like a formal dining room. Or they may have, instead of a living room and a den, there may only be a great room kind of thing. Uh, they may be doing a galley kitchen to save square footage instead of a grander kitchen. And the sweet spot in the marketplace, although there are a lot of headline-grabbing stories about the home prices are so expensive, people are buying 400-square-foot homes. Um, yeah, there's some of that, but the real move in the market is down from the very large average square foot home that people were buying in the United States to more often somewhere between 900 and 1,500 square feet, which with computer-aided design can be a very good, functional, efficient space that gives you enough room to live in You've got less to heat and cool, less to maintain, and the lots are smaller because the houses are smaller. 
And so the builders are able to give you ultimately more value in an odd sort of way instead of how we used to think about how many bedrooms, how many square feet, how big's the yard. The yards are smaller, the houses are smaller, and the spaces are more practical, including in a lot of cases, smaller bedrooms. And Krista, I know from all my years volunteering with Habitat for Humanity that we are able on a tight lot to build a four bedroom, two bath home that is around a thousand square feet and feels spacious inside because of computer aided design. They really do. So this can be done and it's something that's the opposite of where American mentality has been for since the 1970s, but it is taking us almost back to a different era with smaller, more practical spaces. All right, we'll go to questions. This one's from David in New Jersey. We currently have a Pitney Bowes, is that how you say it? Pitney Bowes. Stamp machine and are looking to discontinue the lease next month as our mail volume is down as everything is now emailed. Have you reviewed the postage options available to small business owners and individuals? And can you recommend any? So I'll tell you who the dominant player is as an alternative to a traditional stamp machine. Uh, postage machine. I haven't had a Pitney Bowes question 10 years, 15 years. I mean, we used to get questions about uh, going with different stamp machine companies. That was a common question we got if you go back 20 years ago. And I don't think in the last 10. Um, Stamps.com is an alternative that's probably the largest alternative where you use a printer, if you still have one, use a printer to print postage, it tracks it, and it is uh, an efficient process. There are some other smaller players out there. But usually now, anybody starting in business would no longer have a postage machine. They would use an electronic version like stamps.com or one of their competitors and not go with because Pitney Bowes has competitors for postage machines but it's not common that people would use any of them anymore it sounds like they don't need it for sure right Steve in Georgia says Clark what's the matter with the credit bureau's algorithms my credit score is usually between 828 and 832 and I recently received notice from Credit Karma about a change to my score I logged in and saw my new score was 800, a drop of 29 points. What did I do to cause this decrease? I bought a refrigerator at a big one of the big stores. They were offering a 5% discount and six months interest-free financing if I used their card, so I did. And looking at Credit Karma, it appears that I'm being penalized for increasing my credit limit on this card, um, even though my overall credit utilization is less than 5%. I have 40 plus years of credit experience, never carry an interest bearing balance on any card, have zero debt, and of course pay all my bills on time. I would think that the Bureau algorithms would know all of this. I know 800 is still a good score, so this is more of an aggravation than a real problem, but geez, what gives? So Steve, um, Credit Karma bases the credit scores you get on something called Vantage. Vantage is very volatile. It is a joint venture of Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian trying to take market share away from FICO, which is the uh, more reputable scoring model, more recognized scoring model for granting credit. And you probably have, with the credit cards you have, your score is that high, generally around 830. Uh, you probably have a number of credit cards that give you your FICO score for free. You won't see as much volatility with that one. But it's not at all unusual with the Vantage scoring model. That it's not that you increase your credit limit on the store card. It's probably that buying a big refrigerator, you're using a big percent of your available credit on that card. And even though your overall utilization is still quite low, running up a big balance on any of your cards can uh, have an impact. I recently gave a large charitable donation on a credit card that used up a big chunk of its limit. 
and my credit score fell about 40 points temporarily and then I had to wait a whole billing cycle till I paid that off then my score went back up on my credit karma but it took a big nosedive because of running up a big amount of available credit using up a big amount of available credit on that one card so nothing to fret about it's just how the Vantage scoring model gives so much impact to high utilization on a on a card on one particular card all right since we did away with the clarky of the day tony in kentucky decided to write one in he says <laughs> 10 years ago march 2014 i started listening to clark at that time clark had a call and the guy said clark i've been listening to you for 10 years i was in awe i thought the knowledge he accumulated after listening for 10 years i thought about it now I've reached that level after not missing a show or a podcast in the past 10 years, and I'm much better off for it. Clark has helped oh. me out emotionally, mentally, and financially. I've even called Team Clark a few times, and they were beneficial as well. Well, <laughs> Tony, thank you very much for that compliment. And I bet you also have really good suggestions how we can improve the content we provide and how we present the content for the audio and video podcast. If you are a 100 percenter, you have never missed a podcast or prior radio show in 10 years. Man, mm. I'm sure there are things that we do that have to annoy you that <laughs> either of us do. Probably me, uh, not you, Krista. But I, anyway. I think it was very nice. I thought that was very, very nice. You know how hard it is for me to take I know. And Tony, I'm sure you share the knowledge with other people, and that's what it's all about. Yeah, and that is, that is really true. And what we try to do with all the elements that we offer here on the, the YouTube show, the audio podcast, our websites, our newsletters, social media, our Team Clark Consumer Action Center, it's all designed to give you confidence, knowledge, power in your own life over your own finances and your own future. And that's what it's about. And I know I can tell by the words you wrote that you have felt that empowerment. And that's why we do what we do with every element we do. And so Thank you so much for your years of loyalty, and I hope that somebody else will hear you today and say, well, I'm a brand new listener, so this is a 10-year rule, huh? <laughs> and so 10 years really gave you a postgraduate degree in how to take control of your wallet, and I'm so glad for that. Thank you for taking the time to write in, and remember our goals for you to learn ways to save more. Spend less and avoid getting ripped off.